Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Good morning, Pam. Good morning, Mom and Dad. So, the preacher has been preaching all the way up to this point, and now he reaches the final chapter, the final countdown, right? You know, the, the final chapter, and it, the formal part of the sermon has now ended, is done. And the preacher's writing changes a bit. In fact, there were some who went, I don't know if this was a part of the original because it just changes in style and word usage, but yet it, it really does have a lot of the same similarities. And so they very quickly said, nope, it is all, this was all originally part of the same book of the Bible. But the preacher's writing, it changes a bit in a style and he now ends with some challenges. He challenges us first with hospitality and he says, let Christian love continue. Let brotherly love continue. Christian love is hospitality. You know, taking his sermon in as a whole up to this point of challenges, uh, one individual, Thomas Long, put it this way. He said, because Jesus Christ, the firstborn of all time, the heir of all things, is the great high priest who offered the perfect and lasting sacrifice and now sits in the majesty at the right hand of God, because of all of this, polish up the silver and set the table for company. You're going to have company. You ought to have company. You ought to show Christian love, brotherly love, and hospitality to one another. You know, when we share a meal or we do life together in a life group and we meet at someone's home, and, and, and that, that's why I love life groups. We have individuals coming to our life groups that have yet to set foot into our church. Now, let me define, because there's some that do that in Sunday school, right? And, and often those that come to a Sunday school class, and this is not on our church here, this is a general statement, okay? Um, but there are those that will come to Sunday school class, but because they're mad about something at the, the church level, they won't come into the church service. They'll go to Sunday school, and then they go home. That's their church. Well, that's not what it was intended to be. We weren't meant to forsake the greater fellowship of the church, just because we're in a small group of people that we really like. But in that reverse side of it, you have individuals nowadays who will not step foot into the church. John Wesley, even in his early groups, they were the inviting stages. They were the, as Dr. Charles Arn puts it, the side doors. Somebody might come into a quilting ministry and go, wow, I, I, I really like these people. And then they begin to join the church. Somebody might step into a motorcycle meeting that meets at the church or an AA meeting or a celebrate recovery meeting or something and go, you know what? These people really, I, I, I fit with them. I want to know more. And then come to the greater gathering of fellowship on Sunday mornings. That's what hospitality does. That's why we're called to break bread in our homes to meet and grow. When we share a meal and do life together, we show mutual love, a mutual respect. And this love makes room for all strangers, for all friends, for everyone. You know, I just recently... 
we had an individual in a life group in um, the last place we lived, and I got a, a text and uh, uh, from a gentleman on a Saturday morning, a friend of ours, and, and, and he goes, hey, can I call you? And I'm like, okay, this is unusual. I mean, they, they've come out and visited us once in the last two years, you know, so we're, we're close, but not like just call you on the phone close, right? That's not uh, we're guys. That's not our relationship, you know? And uh, he calls me and here he had seen somebody broke down on the side of the road. And he's like, you know what? God told me I need to help them. And he was on the way to a, a, a men's gathering um, at the local uh, pond, you know, and the park. And he stopped and picked up this lady and they began to be talking. And I mean, he did a lot of things back and forth for her. Good morning, Jody. Praying for you. Hope you're doing well. And, and and he did a lot of things back and forth for this woman, like had to, you know, her wrench, her, her jack wasn't the right size, his, he's got a big van like ours, so it wasn't the right size, he went and got another one, then the, the crowbar she had wouldn't fit, the lug nuts, he had to go get another, I mean, it was just back and forth, and it took him all morning, and in the morning, and in this conversation and stuff, he, 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 she goes, hey, just take me back to my house, we'll get a tow truck, it's okay, thank you so much, and so her house was right by this park, and in the conversation of, why are you going to the park, and he goes, well, because my church youth, my, my church men's group is meeting there today, and she's like, oh, hey, good morning, pregnant Michaela, and happy early birthday to you, and, uh, and and so he he uh, he began to talk about the church. He goes, so what what church do you go to? And, and so he uh, he shares. I go to Calvary Wesleyan Church. And she goes, oh, I used to go there. And in fact, I was in one of their life groups. She goes, I didn't go to church much, but I went in the life group, and it really like I, I mean I, I accepted Christ because of the life group. And and starts going on and on about this. And she goes, you know what? I got in some legal trouble, went to jail for a while, and I'm out. And I really, you know what? This is a God thing because I knew I needed to be going back to church, but it was I, I was scared and I was prideful. And she goes, and you know, the life group I went to, it was in that that house right next to the church with that that pastor with all the kids. And and here she had been in our life group a couple times around and come to know the Lord and and everything through the life group. And now well, finally, and she came to church a little bit, but not as consistently as she did the life group. Life groups have a way of growing us and reaching people who are far from God and finding a way for them to join. It's a beautiful picture of this hospitality that invites friends and strangers. You know, another form of hospitality is taking a new person out to lunch. You know, when I first was looking for a house in Iowa. So we were moving from Michigan to Iowa. And I was traveling there alone, living there uh, in an extended stay America. Mandy and the kids were still back in Michigan. And I started visiting a couple churches and there was one church. We actually went to this church. It was a very small church in a holiness denomination, an old church too. We were only the, 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 Pastor had a couple young kids, and so we were the only two families in with young kids. But can I tell you why in a church that wasn't the up and coming, it wasn't the fun church, why we stayed there for almost two years? Because alone, I went to that church one Sunday, didn't have the family with me. And a older couple came up to me, retired couple, and they're like, hey, we go out to dinner every Saturday, Sunday after church. Would you like to join us? And they invited me to lunch and I got to know them and they got to know me. They got to know the family and they knew the kids' names before they ever visited. That hospitality is what drew us to a church that really was not what we would have gone to. It was a dying church. It's a church that has since been closed and um, relaunched under a new name and everything. It, it, it's a, it was a sad story. But God brought us there because of the hospitality of somebody. And so maybe you're on this phone and you're from my church. And if you're from my church, I challenge you when you see a new person, take them out to lunch. And if you do, I'll pay. Keep the bill, keep the receipt, bring it to me. We'll take care of it as a church. Okay. I, I believe that much that hospitality is that important that I, I have a fund. I'll make sure it comes out of. Okay. To reimburse you for taking someone to lunch. It's that important to help them feel at home inside of our church. If you don't go to our church, talk to your pastor. Maybe he'll 
help you pay for that. <laughs> Maybe God will help you to not have Starbucks five days a week so that you can pay for it. Okay. If the pastor won't, I don't know, but it's important to show hospitality and the preacher is pointing us to that. You see someone that is new, reach out to them. He then says, you do it because, well, we could be entertaining angels unaware, like the stories of Abraham and countless other stories in the Old Testament where individuals were actually angels. The second thing that he points to is that Christian, we show Christian love, not just in hospitality, but we show Christian love, not just to strangers, but Christian love to the suffering. We then are told to minister to the wounded. Ministry of empathy, not condescending pride. We don't do it because, well, you're naturally compassionate. We say, well, I'm not a compassionate person, so therefore I, I can't show Christian love to the, the wounded. We don't do it because we're naturally compassionate, but we do it because God called us to do it. And when he calls us, he will equip us. He showed us how because he was compassionate to us, to you. He showed mercy to you. You know, Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, was born about 160 A.D. or Common Era, as they like to say now, instead of A.D. Um, but from 160, he died somewhere around 240. And, and here's what he said about this. He goes, it is our care for the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of many of our opponents. Only look, they say. Look how they love one another. They themselves give, given over to mutual hatred of one another, and so they notice our love. Look how they prepare to die for one another, they themselves being ready to kill one another. <laughs> Thus had this saying become a fact. Hereby shall men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's through Christian hospitality to one another that to the lonely, to the strangers, to the broken and wounded, do we show that we are believers. We do it because Jesus was compassionate to us. You know, it's from God. There, there are times I... You know, we do these spiritual gift tests, and years ago in my walk with Christ, mercy was one of the lowest. Yeah, I didn't get it. God's worked on me in personality in different ways. And now I can sit and I can counsel with someone, and there are times that they need to hear Dr. Phil. They need to hear the stop it. And there are other times that God has spoken to them and I've not had to speak a word. They need someone who will listen. Someone who will just take the burden from their shoulders for just a moment so they can think rationally. Someone who might ask them a question. Do you know the best answers we can give somebody are the questions that we ask. Jesus didn't answer his questions, did he? Jesus asked a lot of questions. We learn sometimes when we think about it on our own self, when we're challenged to study. When we're challenged, I can sit and tell somebody, you're loved of God. God doesn't make junk. He has said, and I could go through scripture, but until they read it, and until they believe it, because they've found it, then it doesn't sink in in the same way as me giving them the answers. It's kind of like in school. If you had the test key, you never learned. God needs to reveal things to us through our searching for answers, pressing into the walls of life. 
the third thing that the preacher challenges us with here at the end is we're challenged to watch out for sexual sins and money sexual sins and money and he kind of loops these together you know the community can be destroyed by sexual immorality the community the community we live in and the community that we worship in it seems like almost every day in the news or every week in the news we see it on the news of another pastor that's failed or that now it's the church in France, the Catholic church in France that's done a study and found um, it supposedly ended in the 70s, but a lot of abuse that took place in that early time, the 60s and 70s. Satan wasn't just fighting in the holiness movement, making us legalistic. Satan was fighting in many other denominations and church groups to break to break them to lead people away from Christ sexual immorality and lust can destroy the faith of many whether you're the pastor or whether you're just a church member And we are all called to a life of holiness because those lives are at stake. Because your witness, the words that come out of your mouth and then the life that you lead need to act up. That we should flee from all signs. And money the desire for more. The giving over to the love of money causes us to go to God with a clenched fist. How many times I've talked with individuals in the church that do not believe in giving. They don't believe in supporting the church. And only God can really convict them of that. I can speak till I'm blue in the face. And I had one young man go, I see, you know, I, I know what you're doing. And I know why you got to do that because you got to pay the bills. But I just don't believe that, you know, you have to tithe. And... But I watch as their Christianity is broken shallow because they walk to God with a clenched fist like the rich young ruler trying to be good enough on their own and unwilling to surrender that area to Christ instead of walking to him with an open palm Now, these were challenges to the church, not just to leaders. I mean, we'll read when we get into James, James chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, you know, that, that whole idea of, and let me just turn to it because it's right here, you know, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. You know, people want to be, you know, they, they strive for the position and power. I could go into the politics right in our own county. There are some individuals that are very humble about their positions, and yet they run in a group, and I know some of them, uh, that are uh, very power hungry and are seeking the next big position. And that humility is what they need. But yet the position and the power and the fame is what they're seeking. That's right. You can't receive uh, um, with clenched hands. You have to have open hands to be able to receive God's God's blessings. You know, that's not a health and prosperity gospel. If you've watched these calls at all, you know that I don't believe in that or preach that, right? Um, but so often as leaders, we see people 
strive for leadership in the church to be a part of boards, to be a part of committees, to be teachers in, in life groups or small groups and Sunday school classes, or they want to they want to teach, you know, it's, it, it's that new believer that walks up and goes, Hey pastor, um, I think God's called me to preach. I want to preach on Sunday. Well, you know, there's a lot of stuff in your life. You know, there, there's a lot of learning yet. You know, there's a, there's a lot of growth that you need. Um, you know, you don't, don't talk about things that you're still in the middle of. You, you talk about things that if God has brought you through, um, but we seek the power. We seek the position, the fame, the glory, the pats on the back. Instead of giving God all the glory and as leaders being humble, seeking him in everything we do. You know, there's a quote that I have over here on my bookshelf and it says, to be accountable to him, to God, is to be delivered from the tyranny of human criticism. John Stott, but too often as leaders, we worry more about what others think instead of following what God tells us to do. We shouldn't seek leadership. God will thrust it upon us for those who are prepared and ready. Because if we seek leadership, it can lead to pride then leads to other falls that lead to even sexual immorality and the love of money. And it leaves a wake of brokenness. Leaves a wake of people who go, oh, I won't go to that church because so-and-so goes there. God can provide hope and keep, he can provide healing and breakthrough in the midst of all of it, but it does hurt. You know, in our community right here, we can go back into a time in the, the 70s. We had a commune, a commune down in Orwell that was a part of the Jesus movement and some amazing musicians came out of it and they were a part of it because they were seeking that artistic community. And then before too long, they begin to see that the leader in charge, he had no accountability, kind of like what the news is saying about Mark Zuckerberg, right? And Facebook, but he had no accountability, no board holding him accountable. Everybody just said yes. And it led to a wake of scandal, molestation, and abuse. That he skipped the country and came back after the Statue of Limitations and lives still on this farm down in Orwell, which is just south of us here. There are countless churches in our area, including our own, that had issues with pastors falling to immorality. God was moving in our county in a new way. And Satan stepped in and on a wide scale sought to break it, and he did. And we still live in a time that has a lot of lethargic believers and a lethargic look at Christ, unwilling to, and willing to live in holiness before people. So my prayer is that God would break that. He'd start with you. He'd start with me. And that in the areas that we live, we would walk out before God first, growing inwardly different so that outwardly and corporately His light shines. His name is made known. His name is glorified. You know, the world makes a big deal about the name on that tombstone. We write songs about the dash. And yet in Scripture, we hear that only that which is done for Christ will last. You know, I'd be okay if my name didn't live on. Now, that's something that's taken a long time for me to say. 
but I would rather the impact for Christ. That people would look back and go, you know, there was that pastor that one time. I don't remember his name. He had all those kids. I don't remember his name, but that wasn't what was important. You see, I got saved in that life group. <laughs> That's what matters most. May our lives be that impact on those that we come in contact with. So God, may we, as the author of Hebrews has challenged us, begin with hospitality to one another. Lord, hospitality to the stranger, uh, to the suffering God, that we would watch out that our lives are walked out in holiness before you, seeking to please you and not man. Seeking to be careful that the words that come out of our mouth are truly biblical and, and not hearsay. That they would be truly biblical and not just spiritualist. <laughs> Truly biblical and, and not superstitious. Yeah, there's a lot of superstition in our day and age today in the church. Even among people who are seeking Christ. So God, may we find ourselves truly digging into your word, being changed by your Holy Spirit, and having the words of our mouths reflect your words in the life of your son. Change us. We surrender it all to you. Open our clenched hands so that we can receive from you. We surrender. In the name of your son, Jesus, we ask it in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray it. Amen. Amen. Well, go in peace, and I pray you have a great weekend, and uh, we will see you next week.